Hello and welcome to the Grove Church Podcast. I'm Charlie Lofton, the lead pastor there, and we are so glad that you're joining us. Whether you are a member and you're just catching up on a sermon that you missed or you're someone who's brand new, we are really glad that you are joining us. And if you are new in some way, and I know that a lot of people will do that, will listen to sermons first before they visit, I want you to know that we would love to meet you at any point. You can join us live in our services on Sunday, 9 and 1030, or our streaming service at 1030. Either way, we would love to be able to get to know you. And regardless of why you are here uh, listening to this sermon today, thank you so much for joining us. Hey, good morning. Hey, if you are new, I'm Charlie, the lead pastor here, and really glad that you are worshiping with us today. And as Abigail mentioned uh, earlier, we're in the middle of a series. We're kind of trying to ask, you know, we're asking and trying to answer some pretty big picture questions leading us up to Easter, where we will talk about the question, did Jesus really rise from the dead? And what is the significance of that for me? Look forward to sharing that with you guys in a couple of weeks. A couple of weeks ago, we talked about, um, is the Bible true? Can we trust it? Last week, Mark was here and talked about how, you know, is there really a knowable God out there that really cares about us that we can interact with? And today we're going to start, today we're going to ask like a big picture kind of why question. Now, I was thinking about this today, you know, when you think about why, if you're, if you're a parent uh, with a, a little kid or you were parents with little kids, or maybe now you're a parent with teenagers or uh, the, that question, why, it, it just, it, it, it hits different at different times. And if, and if you have babies and you don't have a toddler yet, I just, I know you think, oh, it's going to be so great. Someday they're going to be able to talk. No, someday they're going to be able to talk. And, um, and, and, and they say, why? And, you, and, and how you feel about it? I was thinking about this. I'm a math guy. I was thinking about this. I imagine a three-dimensional graph. How many times in a row are you saying why? How old is the kid asking and how much sass is coming at me? Like there's, there's a point at which it's like it's, it's just too much. And I learned this. This is, a, this is not a parenting trip I necessarily recommend. But we, we had two kids and then we had a third one much later. So we kind of got a second shot at it. I realized that you, could just, you can just not answer, right? The toddler goes, okay, it's time to go to bed. Why? I said it was time to go to bed. Like well, you, don't, you don't know what that word means. You're just trying to get just, just go to bed. Just go to bed. Um, but why? It's a great question actually. It's actually a great question, and um, I do recommend, as, as, as long depending on what side of the graph you're on, I do recommend answering it because when you, when, you, when you ask and answer this question, you are helping your kid kind of understand the way the universe works. Why, why, why are things like this? You know, because, you, again, you can get a lot of different things from this, right? I mean, I need you to explain this to me. I don't understand, I don't understand how this works. Or you can ask why and be like, well, why is it this way instead of this way? And the more that you're able to kind of engage with that question, the deeper that you can, the, your relationship can be, the more that they can understand the world around them. But again, I do understand that sometimes why comes across in a way that's like the only answer is like, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, what? Right, that's the, you know, there's a little too much, a little too much sass coming at you. And you know, there's lots of examples in the Bible, where people are asking God the why question, and it's amazing because lots of times when it gets asked, it is coming with a little too much sass. And God says the thing back to them, the thing that you're saying. You did say before you were a parent, or some of you who aren't parents yet, you promised, I'm never going to say this to my kid. But God actually says it all the time, which of course is because I said so, right, or because I'm your parent or whatever. Lots of times he gets asked this question with sass, and he's like, oh, last time I checked, I'm God, you're currently not, so just settle down. And so sometimes that is it. Sometimes you ask these questions, like sometimes it's, it's, it's a pushing against authority. Why is there authority? But some of these bigger picture why questions that we can ask really are, it's like I really want to understand the way the world works. I really want to understand the way God works. I want to understand reality a little bit better. This seems to be the way the world is why isn't it more like this? And again, I think asking and attempting to answer these questions can very often lead us to really profound, deeper understanding and connection with God. And one of the biggest why sorts of questions that people ask, and it is very common, people ask it a lot, has been asked for a very long time, and has been summarized like in books and they talk about it, uh, we refer to it as kind of this philosophical problem that is called the problem of evil. 
And the problem of evil, I don't know if you've ever heard that expression before, but the problem of evil essentially comes down to these three different things that Christians believe about God and the way the world works and figuring out how we resolve these things. So I've got a slide here with these three, with these three ideas on it. And the first one is, is that God is all loving. God is a kind God, a loving God, and only wants what is best for people. Um, the second would be is that God is all powerful. God has the ability to fix or change or do anything he wants. He is not restrained at all. He has all of the power that he needs to do whatever he wishes he could do. And the third one is, is that there is an unreasonable amount of evil in the world. Now, we can tolerate a little bit of evil. Like it's a consequence. You do something bad, a consequence happens. We, under, we understand that. But the, the amount of evil in the world is so great that it, the world doesn't make sense based on these two ideas. So if God is all loving and all powerful, why would he tolerate the level of evil that he does? Why doesn't he do something about it? This is the way that people will phrase this a lot of different ways. And so you've got this conundrum where it feels impossible for people to make sense of all three of those. And so what will happen is, very often is that a group will just disregard one of them. So there is a group and their way of thinking about it is called process theology. And the idea then that they have is that God must not be all powerful. He is all kind, but he is not all powerful. So God created the universe, but does not have the means or the ability to control it or do anything in it. And he becomes a positive force in the world, encouraging people, but does not have the power really to do anything. I do not recommend becoming a process theologian. I do not recommend that at all, but I do want you to know that it exists. And that's kind of one of the ways people resolve this. Now, you may think that there is no one who is willing to disregard the third one, but you would be wrong because there are groups of people, and I believe that Christian scientists, whether they recognize it or not, have fallen into that. And there are certain parts of Buddhism that kind of fall into this, where they, what they will say is, is that what you believe to be evil and suffering is really more, illusor, it's more of an illusion, right? And, and, and it is the recognition that this is an illusion and you should separate yourself from it in some way. And once you recognize that it isn't real, then you will live this different life. Now, a Christian scientist or a Buddhist may feel like that that is an oversimplification. And it probably is. But there's at least some elements to that in certain ideas where, yeah, it exists, but not, but not really. And if you can just separate yourself from it somehow. But again, the most common thing like say that an atheist would do or someone who is asking this question in a very challenging sort of way will say God must not be good and if he is not good he is not worthy of worship or maybe he just he doesn't even really exist but what what do we do with it what do we do with it I'm I am a, a follower of Jesus and have been for a really long time and I've thought about this question a lot and I really do I agree Essentially, with all three of the premises, God is all loving. God is love. God is has is all powerful. And there is a, there is a degree of evil and suffering and pain in this world that just doesn't make sense. That cannot be answered simply. What do we What do we do with this? And people will bring this question to you sometimes, and I've had it happen to me several times, where they're challenging me in some sort of way for being a Christian. Well, how do you explain this? And they'll say it really aggressively and almost kind of have like a ha, a ha, an aha moment. Like, hmm. like, like I've won the argument just by putting it out there as if it's the first time I've ever heard it. As if it's the first, like, oh, I, I will, well, it's the first time I've ever even thought about it. Like, no, not only is this not the first time I've heard someone talk about it, not the first time I've thought about it. This is not some new phenomenon. It's not American ideal. This is not something that happened in, you know, post, post enlightenment or anything like that. Or this, this isn't new. In fact, this question, even a lot of the framing of this question, you can find several examples of this in the Bible. Uh, one of the oldest stories, even though it is in the middle of your Bible, Job, one of the oldest stories in the Bible, is really revolves around this whole idea. Really awful things happen to Job, and he and his friends, air quotes, I don't know if you know the story, they're not great friends at the time, right? They're asking this question, like, why is this happening? And they're all coming to different ideas about what's going on, and Job is having a real 
significant crisis about it. There are some times where Abraham asked God a, sim- a similar question. Abraham talks like this. Moses talks like this. The Psalms, David is very often asking this question, God, why are you letting this happen? The book of Ecclesiastes is trying to make sense of a world that doesn't make sense. Why, why do wicked people prosper? Why do bad things happen to good people? They're asking these sorts of questions. And honestly, I think Jesus hints at this on the cross. When he says, God, why have you forsaken me? Why is this what we're having to do? And we're going to look at a passage in Romans 8 where I believe that Paul is at least, he's contemplating these ideas too. And I think has some really good insight for us. So we're going to be in Romans 8, starting in verse 18. I consider... I consider that our present sufferings are not worth comparing with the glory that we be, will be revealed in us. And so he's already saying, hey, you, we're going through some sufferings. You're going through a hard time. We're going through a hard time. And I want us, we need to put this in context. So the first thing he's saying here is like we need to think about it. Like what's coming is going to be so much greater, but that is not, he's not minimizing suffering because he's about to get really into it. But we're kind of starting this process here talking about the sufferings that we're currently going through. Verse 19 For the creation waits in eager expectation for the children of God to be revealed. For the creation was subjected to frustration, not by its own choice, but by the will of the one who subjected it, in hope that the creation itself will be liberated from its bondage to decay and brought into freedom and glory of the children of God. We know that the whole creation has been groaning, as in the pains of childbirth, right up to the present time. Not only so, but we ourselves, who have the first fruits of the Spirit, grown inwardly as we wait eagerly for our adoption to sonship, the redemption of our bodies. So I don't know how well you're able to kind of follow along with kind of Paul's thinking there, but he's just kind of describing the situation. And there's a lot of, there's, there's suffering, and we need to kind of put it in perspective based on what I believe that God has coming for us. And then he starts talking about the suffering. He's like, if you, I mean, if you look around him, it's like creation itself is kind of groaning about this. Cre- cre- creation itself is just like, you can tell that it is broken and hurt and it is upset. And it's like, it is yearning. I mean, it is yearning for something different than what this is. And in the same way, like, like the planet figuratively, metaphorically is groaning out of its own brokenness in the same way. We feel it too. Our hearts are groaning, recognizing that whatever this is, isn't it. This isn't it. And we, and we are yearning for something different. It shouldn't be like this. You know it. The world knows it. What do we do with it? And again, I believe in those three premises. God is all loving. God is all powerful. And this world is just awful in so many different ways and so many different times. So what do we do? How do we reconcile those three? And really, honestly, that's the, the thing that I would say is that there's just more to it than that. It's not that we have to get rid of any of those three. I just think that there is more going on here than that. There are more than just those three things. And so what we're going to spend just a few minutes here doing is just kind of looking at a few more of things that I think that can help us make sense of it. I don't want to overpromise and underdeliver. I am not suggesting that somehow in a short, brief, 30-minute window of time that we're going to be able to resolve this thousands-year-old philosophical question. But I do think that there are some good ways for us to kind of think and frame this as we're trying to make sense of the world that God has placed us in and to reconcile what we believe about God with our experience of this world. And so a few of these things, I'm going to put them out here. And by themselves, they're not going to be particularly shocking or overwhelming. And and on first glance, they're going to be unsatisfactory. But I think that if we can put a lot of these ideas together, we can come up with a... We can just have some peace as we're trying to wrestle through this issue. And the first one is one of the simplest, which is that sin has consequences. When you do something wrong, when you do something evil, sin has a consequence. It just does. That's just the way the world works. And a lot of the suffering that we experience in the world has to do with, I did something to myself, someone did something to me, 
or the world, uh, the, some sort of natural disaster in the world brought some sort of suffering, right? A disease or a weather event or something like that. But I think it is important from the very beginning to kind of start with this most, simp- this, this most simple idea of sin has a consequence. When you do something bad, something bad happens. You don't just do something bad and then just, and, and, and it's nothing. Sin has a, a consequence. And again, I know that it does not explain everything, but I think it is important to understand the framing of this because we're going to have to start with this idea of why is there evil in the world? We, we did that. We did that. And so anytime, you know, when you as a kid or with kids that you have, when they do something bad, it has a consequence. Sometimes it is a natural consequence. Sometimes it's a consequence you put on them in order to teach them and help them to understand, hey, you, you, you cannot do that. Either a natural or a put-upon consequence that happens in order to train, in order to teach. And that happens in the world. And you're like, bro, that's, that's just nearly not enough. I, I get it. The amount of evil and suffering in the world is not explained by that. But at a minimum, we need to make sure that we start there because we're we're really kind of asking and answering two different questions. Why is there evil in the world and why doesn't God do something about it? The reason there is evil and suffering in the world, we, we, we brought it here. Okay, But again, that maybe explain why when I do something, something bad happens, but that it, that's not the same as I shouldn't have to suffer just because you did something, right? But we need to add this. Not only does sin have consequences, but we are all interconnected. We are all in this together. It is, it is us. We are a group, and God views us as a group. And I think you would be surprised if, if you read the scripture to understand that almost all of the commands that God gives in the scripture are plural commands. You should do this. It is a plural you. If it was a southern translation of the Bible, we would get it. Y'all, y'all need to be doing this, right? It's command. Like, we, we, we do this. And the, 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 the things that you do have a community effect. And that's just the way the world works. And it really isn't possible to create a world in which that doesn't work. We are in this together. And, and, and what you do affects the people that you know, which affects people, which affects people. That's just the way that it works. And that's why there really aren't very many just like pure libertarians out there in the world that believe that everybody should just kind of be left to self-govern. It doesn't really work that way because what you do has an effect. And again, just in a, in, a, in a very natural way, take God out of it. Take any spiritual consequence out of it. A lot of disease that is in the world is something that we did. A lot of the damage that is being done to our world and to our environment, we did this. And you can't say, well, I'm not the one that did it, so I shouldn't have to suffer. We can say shouldn't all you want. But the reality is we're a team, and, 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 and the way that we behave, it has, it has lingering sorts of effects. And you can tell that God really views the world this way. And there's one story in particular that just always kind of rattles me. It's in Joshua where they're called to, 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 to conquer this, this area, and God says, don't take any treasure, don't take any treasure. One dude out of hundreds of thousands, one dude takes some treasure. And hides it in his tent. And then the next verse says, And God was upset with the nation of Israel because they had disobeyed him. Dude, it's one dude. And then they all suffered the consequence of that. And that is the way that God views us. And you can say it shouldn't be this way. But we don't have any complaints about all of the good ways that this affects us. You do not have to reinvent technology. You do not have to come. If the cure to a disease already exists, you get to enjoy the benefits of that. All the good ways in which we are interconnected and the way that we receive love and have grown and the things that are good things. And so we have to recognize, hey, there's a lot of evil out there. I did my share. 
we, are, we again, we are all in this together. And so God is all loving. God is all powerful. Sin has a consequence. We're all interconnected. And our sin has broken the world. Our sin has broken the world. Paul says this over and over again in this passage we're looking at in Romans chapter 8. It is, it is groaning. And you go back to the origins of that in Genesis 3 during the fall after Adam and Eve's first sin. Before there was sin, and this is going to be tough on some of y'all to understand this. Even before there was sin, there were jobs. There was work. I know work feels like it's part of, part of the problem, right? There was a job. Adam had a job. I want you to take care of this garden. But work didn't become work until Genesis chapter 3. And basically, he said, part of the curse, part of the curse is that the world's going to fight back now. And you're going to try to take care of it, and you're going to try to make food, and you're going to have to try to you know, do the things that you need in order to survive. And, and, and the world now is cursed. Work becomes toil. A job becomes a problem. And that is part of what happened in Genesis chapter 3. But again, take Genesis 3 out of it. Take the spiritual element out of it. The situation is still the same. The things that we are doing have an effect on the world in which we live. Not just on the people, but on the actual world itself. In the, in the, in the food chain, in the, in, the, in the weather cycle, all of these things that we're doing have a cumulative effect on the world that we live in. God is good. God is powerful. But look at what we did. We did this. And again, this problem of evil, I think, breaks down into two very distinct questions. Why is there so much evil in the world? Why doesn't God do something about it? And I think we need to have a very sobering understanding at least of the first part of this. And so if we are going to wrestle with the, this biggest of why questions, at a minimum, we need to take some shared responsibility with God. Like, I wish you would do something about it, but really what we're asking, I wish you would do more about this thing that we did to ourselves. We did this to our world we did this to each other. I'm still doing this to myself. I wish you would do something about this. God didn't do this. He allowed us to do this. And some people here is like, well, you know, God gave us free will, and this is a consequence of that. And some people respond to that. It's like, well, I would rather not, I would rather not have free will than, than have to deal with this, which is an interesting way of phrasing it. I would choose to not have free will. Like, we, 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 again, you're, yeah, we, we can't even, con, we, can't, we can't even really conceive of not having a choice because this is, this is who God made us to be and, and sometimes that's great and sometimes it's not. But as we are wrestling with the way the universe is and how we make sense of it and how we make sense of who God and his role in that is, let us not minimize our own role, both individually and collectively, into what we did. So, God is all-powerful. God is all-loving. Sin has consequence. We're connected to each other. We broke the world. But in those two ideas, God is loving and God is powerful, those are not the only two things that are true about God. There are other things that are just true about God. There's true, there's true things about us and true things about the world that we've talked about. But there's other things that are true about God. And it will say this, that God is also holy and just. Holy is this idea that God is good, perfect, separate. He is on a completely different level. And God is just in that, again, sin has a consequence. You do something wrong. There would be punishment. You do something, you get a reward. I mean, there's, there's justice to that. There's justice in the way that God operates. So a rhetorical question that we have to ask is, what are the consequences? What is the consequence for the amount? What is an appropriate amount of consequence for the amount of sin that is in the world? I don't, I don't know. Like, I don't know if I know the answer to that. I don't know if I know the answer to that question. 
hypothetically, and this is not true, so don't, don't spread any internet rumors or anything, but just imagine that I'm coming, uh, having to come here today and I'm having to confess. I punched somebody in the face a few days ago. I didn't. I swear I didn't, but just hypothetically. I punched somebody in the face a few days ago. Is that good or bad? What? It, it, always? Maybe, maybe, maybe deserved it. Maybe deserved it. How bad is it, though? How bad is it? Well, it depends, right? I, there, was a, there, was a, there, was, there was a guy that was attacking my family, and I punched him to save my family. That's less bad. I just got mad at a dude because he insulted me. I punched him. A woman said something to me, and I didn't like it. I punched her. A kid, a kid came up to me, and he was whining, and I punched him. A kid, a baby, a sick baby. Right? The, there's... How bad is the sin depends on who the sin is against. And I think we all understand this. On this range from person who is trying to hurt my family to sick baby, where does the sin against God go? I think we imagine God is kind of being up here because he's a bro and God, he's God, he can handle it. He's handled it. But one of the things about this scale is the The beauty of the thing, the innocence of the thing, the goodness of the thing. What is a sin? What is an appropriate consequence for a sin against a holy God? It is more significant than I think that most of us want to recognize. Because we imagine, well, God's a bro, and God should just be letting stuff go. God asked us to let stuff go, right? you got to be forgiving. You should be more forgiving. You shouldn't, you should, it shouldn't be all of this. But you need to make sure you understand this. The reason why God requires you to be merciful and requires you to not inflict consequence on other people, you have to be more forgiving because you have been forgiven. Jesus says this all the time. People say this all the time. You need to be forgiving because you have been forgiven. God does not have to be forgiven of anything. He is good. We go back to think, God is good. It's in, the, it's in the three choices, it's in the three things. God is good. What is a sin against a perfectly good God? What does, that, what does that look like? What is the consequence of that? And Paul wraps this up in verse 28, a verse that you'll be familiar with. In part because you've had it misquoted to you. And if you haven't had it misquoted to you, you've at least had it misrepresented to you. Romans 8, 28. And we know that in all things, God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. Now, you may have had that quoted to you in a way where it's like, hey, you know what? No matter what bad things are happening, God is working it to good. He's, He's working to make it good. As if you can craft and weave a bunch of evil things and turn evil things to good. That is, that is not what this says. As we are wrestling with this idea of why there is so much overwhelming suffering and pain and evil in the world. Again, I've, I've got, I've, we've, we've, got to, we've, we've got to take our, our, our share of it. I, I, got, I, got to take my, I got to take my part. But what do I imagine that God is doing? But what it says here is that God is working. He's working for your good. He sees you. He sees you existing in a place full of overwhelming evil. All of this suffering. Living under the consequences of what we did to ourselves. He sees that and he says, I need you to know that I'm, that I'm for you. And I'm working for you. I'm working for your good, even in the evil. And ultimately, I believe this comes down to a matter of faith, and we'll say it this way. That ultimately, no matter how we resolve this, mentally, spiritually, I believe we need to end up here. That we need to trust in God and be comfortable with mystery. I'm in a place I wish I weren't. Experiencing a world I wish didn't ex- I, it existed differently. And I hear about this God who has the power to do something about it but doesn't. 
I hear about this being justice. And this is just kind of us living under the consequences. And we can then imagine we could allow that to lead us to despair. But this is the beauty of the gospel message. It is the beauty of the Easter message that is coming in a couple of weeks. Because God saw that and said, I want to rescue you from that. I want to come get you. I see you in this thing that you made. And I love you in it. I want your good. I want to redeem you. I want to make you new. And where Paul started, what I want to give you is not going to compare to the sufferings that you're going through. We follow and trust a God who left us in some ways to our own consequences, but refused to leave us there. And I put my faith and trust in that God, the God that sent his son, Jesus Christ. I go back to number one, God is good. And even though we've made a mess of it, he's, he sees and he sent his son. And even though my brain can't make sense of it, there is a mystery to this that leads me to trust in him even more. I am comfortable that not everything about this world makes sense to me. I can be at peace with that because I trust in the goodness of God. Let me pray. God, I pray that we would be, that we would be able to trust that even as our brain is having a hard time making sense of the world and the way that it works, as we walk through our own suffering, that God, it would lead us not to despair, it would lead us away from anger, but God, towards trust. And that God, that we would see your son who also suffered greatly and didn't deserve a bit of it. But he did that because he saw us in the mess that we made and wanted us to bring, wanted to bring us hope and life and eternal life with you forever. And so God, as our brains wrestle, God, please help our hearts to trust. And again, we are so thankful for your son who makes all this possible. And it's in his name we pray, amen. Thanks again for joining us on our sermon podcast. And you can learn more about us at thegrovechurch.org. And if you go to thegrovechurch.org slash connect, there's a form you could fill out. Just let us know that you've been listening. And if you want to dig deeper on some of these topics that we cover in our sermon podcast or just in other issues of dealing with culture or theology, those kinds of things, uh, you can check out our Cultivate podcast, which is on the same feed, um, however you found this particular podcast. So again, this is Charlie, the lead pastor at The Grove, and thank you so much for joining us.